Hi everyone, welcome to the AWS Blogger. My name is John Meyer and today we're going to be talking about AWS Outpost Part 2. Before we begin, don't forget to hit that like and click subscribe. First, I'd like to introduce our guest today. He's known for his outstanding use of slide animation, one of the co-authors of the official study guide for AWS Certified Advanced Networking, Principal Developer Advocate for AWS Outpost, Matt Lewis. Matt? Hey, John. How's it going? Great. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. You know, working away. Lots going on. So glad to be here chatting with you today. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you sitting down with us and talking about AWS Outposts. So, Matt, all right, so in the beginning here, I jumped right to it, I had it on premise, but there's a lot more to it. You're gonna go in there, you wanna order an Outpost. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of conversation back and forth to make sure your facility supports uh, all the configuration, you have all the requirements because you are re ultimately responsible for the Outposts on your, within your environment. And we wanna make sure it's a great fit uh, network connectivity, just the same. That that's important as well. Is there anything else we miss uh, that we brought it on? We have it on premise. We have it ready to connect. Uh, is there anything else that we missed? Yeah, um, actually, this is probably a good segue uh, down into the reference architecture, so we can kind of talk about some of the different components that go into connecting the outpost. Um, Okay, so uh, this reference architecture uh, will be available soon as well. I think um, we're just going through some approvals to, to get it published on our white paper site. So this should be a good one to go in and check out. So basically, on the right-hand side, we've got the outpost. And we're just above that, we've got the outpost network devices that we just talked about and, and obviously the, the patch panels that you connect to the outpost will connect through to your customer devices. So you can see here, we've got two lags. So it's basically we're using a ladder topology here. And I do get a lot of questions around, can we do a crosslink between those devices? Um, we actually could potentially, but um, the better architecture that we have here is the ladder topology, where basically we've got each leg almost being independent of each other. And our outpost network devices actually have a connection between uh, themselves so they can communicate in case we have one customer device fail and that sort of thing. And so what you'll also notice is we've got a blue network segment or VLAN B and we've got an orange network segment or VLAN A. And so each outpost network device will actually connect through using multiple VLANs through to your customer device. And the blue segment gives you access from the outpost, from the VPC and the instances inside the outpost through to your on-premises. And so that's gonna be that direct path over what we call the LGW or the local gateway, which is the, the purple icon you can see there. And I think we have a zoom in on that slide we can jump to in a second. The orange segment is going to be how AWS connects back to the region. So in this case, we've got direct connect and uh, we could use public internet as well. And I know John, we were talking about this earlier about um, does an outpost need to have a direct connect? Um, and the answer is no. So we actually built the outpost so that you could use internet connectivity to connect back to the region. And so if we just move from the right-hand side of the drawing to the left-hand side here, you'll notice that we've got that orange line goes all the way through to the outpost service anchor. And that outpost service anchor actually sits in an availability zone. And so what we'll do when we provision the outpost, we'll build an anchor in the availability zone that you choose. So when you when you order the outpost, you say, I'd like this outpost home to this region and this availability zone. We'll build an anchor in that availability zone. And then when we turn on the outpost, where it's on site, we've wheeled it into place, we've plugged in the power and the, um, and the fiber connections, it will come online and call back to the outpost anchor. So if you've got any firewalls or that sort of thing in between the outposts and your internet connection or maybe over your direct connect, you do need to allow an outbound firewall rule for TCP UDP 443 as a destination uh, source port ephemeral ports. And that will basically allow the outpost to create this overlay connection from the outpost back into the outpost anchor. And so that also allows us to manage the outpost because it is a fully managed service, um, but also it allows us to bridge the VPC here. So the purple box you see in the region and then in, in the outpost, we're actually extending that VPC from the region to the outpost. So um, it's actually pretty awesome. You can have um, VPC connectivity 
in, from the region to the outpost and it looks like it's just native VPC, but it's actually going over this service link connection, which is that orange line, in this case over a direct connect, but we could have it go over a public internet connection as well. So what you're saying here is that I can have my VPC and I can have it, and, and right here you, you've got it depicted right on the architecture, is I can split up my VPC into multiple subnets. I can have some live, you know, obviously within AWS environment, but I can have a local subnet that's still attached to that VPC within my outpost, which keeps my, you know, those data sovereign uh, applications within outpost and within my data center, correct? Exactly. So, um, and basically what will happen if, and we're kind of stepping through the whole, the whole process here. So from ordering to site assessment, to connecting network connectivity, to then building your VPC environment. So what will basically happen is once the outpost is online, it will be available, available in your account. You can then create a subnet on that outpost in a particular VPC. And so you take a VPC and you say, I'm, I'd like to create this subnet in this outpost. And just like in the region where a subnet's tied to an availability zone, with outposts, the subnet, which you can see subnet two here, is tied to the outpost. So then when you, you instantiate an EC2 instance, or you bring online an EC2 instance inside that subnet, that's going to reside inside the outpost. Um, so any communications intra VPC will obviously go via the service link, but if you wanted data to only remain inside that subnet, you can um, you can do that as well. And so here's the, always a big question. Uh, so right here on the architecture, I've got subnet to uh, you know on, on the screen, and if I'm looking at that, and my application needs to communicate with other services internally, all that data stays within my data center, within my network, and doesn't traverse through the internet back to AWS, correct? Or Yeah, no, that's actually, um, it's definitely something you need to consider when you're building an outpost. And one definitely one of the things you want to consider is when you're building your VPC architecture, and, and I'll always tell customers this, and it is a tough thing to do, but building a communications matrix. So building a, basically it's almost like an Excel spreadsheet or a list of communications between applications and understanding where those applications will actually flow from a connectivity standpoint. So actually, um, John, do you want to bring up uh, one of the slides on the, the local Land connectivity. Yep. It is slide number 22, I think. Slide number 22, coming right up. Okay, so what you basically, there we go. What you basically see here is we've got the outpost, it's got a VPC, it's got a subnet, subnet three in this case, and an EC2 instance. Now the, uh, thanks, the route table inside the VPC that's assigned to the subnet lets you determine where traffic will go. So one thing to keep in mind right now is the VPC that we got here that we've got here is basically um, equivalent to a CIDR address range, and in this case, it's a 10.1.0.0 slash 16. There's actually a typo there. It says slash one. That's a mistake. <laughs> it should say slash 16. Not sure what happened to the six, but that's fine. Um, uh, but it's probably still there, but the the block is not big enough for it. So that's slash possible. one. <laughs> Slash one, slash one, that's a large range. Um, so basically the VPC range or anything equivalent to that range will always stay inside the VPC. Uh, and you can't actually um, configure a more specific route than that local, uh, there we go, a more specific route than that local route at this point in time. So what that means is when you've got subnet three and an EC2 instance here in the outpost, if it communicates with anything else inside that VPC, it will stay inside the VPC but if that destination for subnet one is in the region, for example, that communication will go over the service link connection. So going from EC2 instance in subnet three to an EC2 instance in the region in the same VPC will traverse the service link connection. So it's always a good idea to be mindful of, okay, I've got this um, cross EC2 connectivity here. How much bandwidth do I have on my WAN connection? And, um, you know, do I want that communication to go via the service link or not? Um, now, another thing you'll notice here as well is we've got our on-premises routes via the LGW. So anything outside of the VPC range, we can send via the LGW. And the LGW is really similar to an internet gateway. So an internet gateway is effectively just a NAT device at very large scale. We have the same thing here. And so we're actually NATing 
any addresses inside the VPC to what we call the customer owned IP range, the 10.10.0.0 slash 26. And that's going to allow you to communicate from instance uh, inside our subnet three over the LGW directly to your on-premises without going via the AWS region. So again, um, Building a communications matrix is always a good idea. Figure out where your instances are, where your applications are on premises, and kind of build the path that you need. So source, destination, uh, port, amount of bandwidth, latency requirements, et cetera. And then you get a, a bit of a view of, okay, this is how I need to build my VPC architecture, and this is how things will communicate on premises and that sort of thing. So always a good exercise to go through. So there's a lot of pre-work that you should do ahead of time, uh, not only but just to go in there and order one, but really kind of map things out. Uh, here's a question, right? I'm, I'm the IT guy and I was like, yeah, I want to order one and I click on order one. Uh, it's not going to ship right away. Something's We're going to have communication back and forth to make sure that I know what I'm ordering, that I have all the requirements. Uh, is there's there's going to be a lot of talk and communication. How fast from when I order one to one reaches on premise is a typical turnaround time? Um, I'm not actually sure right now <laughs> because of the current state of things and and that sort of thing. So it That's really very does true. Depend. Let's um, take that into consideration but, here. <laughs> well, what we are doing though is um, we're working with a lot of co-location providers, um, just in the same way that we worked with co-location providers for Direct Connect. So with Direct Connect, uh, we've deployed in, I think it's up to, uh, you know, 100 plus different pops across the world now uh, where we've got our physical appliances or, or hardware that you can connect to from a Direct Connect standpoint. We're working with those same co-location providers to uh, enable a almost like a fast track for, for Outpost so that if you are in a co-location facility, we have an existing relationship with that co-location facility and we can basically, the, the network site assessment and, and figuring out where the Outpost is going to go and do you have the right amount of power, do you have the right network connectivity, all of those things will basically be almost ready to go because we've already got that pre-existing partnership with the co-location facility. So um, right now, whilst it does depend on where the Outpost is going, if you are shipping an outpost somewhere in, in a very remote region, um, it's obviously going to take a lot longer than if you're in, say, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a co-location facility that's in use, uh, you know, in maybe Silicon Valley or up in Seattle or something like that. Um, that does lead me to <clears throat> that does lead me to a another question, though. I think John, which um, is probably a, a good follow up on the network requirements for outposts. We do ask for a minimum of a one gig connection back to the AWS region right now. And uh, that's basically so that when you've got this intra VPC traffic going from one VPC to another, um, you get a good experience. And if you are doing things like deploying a lot of EC2 instances and doing things like AMI downloads from the region, you're going to get a good experience. So an AMI is a you know very large image, for example, and you, that needs to be downloaded to the outpost so you can deploy the EC2 instance. So um, having a one gig as a minimum is is obviously something that's going to go a long way in um, improving the experience that you have with outposts. From a latency perspective, uh, we are looking uh, at around about 100 to 150 milliseconds as, as being the, the best case right now. Um, but we are also investigating the possibility of, hey, could we have an outpost with a lower than one gig connection? Or could we have an outpost with a greater than 100 to 150 millisecond latency back to an AWS region? Um, so we are getting customers that are asking for that sort of thing. So we are thinking about it and, and whatnot, but we'll, we'll see. Um, we do have a lot of regions right now, though. So um, if you're more than... 100 to 150 milliseconds away from an AWS region right now, you're probably in a really remote region. Um, but believe it or not, lots of customers are asking for that sort of thing. So we'll see. So you actually mentioned it there uh, is the customer experience. And it's not that uh, we can't support it. We want the best customer experience uh, out of it. So minimizing the latency will probably be the best thing to give you that you know that not only the download the experience of it interacting the ami that's coming down so we we don't want a poor one as it comes across correct i mean that's really what we're striving towards yeah so i mean if you if you've got a 10 meg connection to an outpost or something you're just not going to get a great experience because yeah. um we do like outpost is a fully managed service uh, from the the hosts that are in the rack um, to the telemetry data that that you know um, that goes into managing the actual physical hosts and and you know the 
basically the control plane extending that out from the region to the outposts. Um, now, it doesn't need a full gig um, all the time. So we're not talking about you need a dedicated one gig, but we do ask for a one gig that has, you know, a fair amount of that bandwidth available for the outpost to use when you need it. Now, when you need it is probably going to be due to your application deployment, AMI downloads, intra VPC traffic, um, communications from the outpost back through to services in the region like S3. Um, mind you, we have announced that we will be deploying S3 uh, in an outpost, uh, I think it's this year. Um, and I think as of about two days ago, we did just announce RDS in an outpost so oh, you um, ruined my uh question here but uh, my recent oh, really one so you know what let's jump right into it uh uh you know aws just re-announced uh and I, in fact i i'm posting about it a little bit later today so by the time this comes out it'll be fully the support for mysql postgres sql databases on outpost so matt you i mean you mentioned it that's that's pretty cool that's another addition into all the other rds services that already supports correct yeah, and um, so I'll talk about the intentions as well with, with Outposts. You know, on some of our original um, docs that we were putting together around, hey, this is what we want an Outpost to do. The intention is to have the same experience in an Outpost as you would inside the AWS region. And so what that means is having all of the services that are available in the region available in the outpost. Now, unfortunately, some of our services like a, a network load balancer or uh, maybe the transit gateway, you know, those services are services that are immensely scalable. Um, you know, so a network load balancer or a transit gateway, transit gateway, for example, can support up to 50 gigabits per second of traffic per availability zone um, when you connect a transit gateway to a VPC. Now, to be able to support that amount of scale, we obviously need to have, you know, more than just one rack's worth of hardware to, to support the service. So no. um, what you'll probably see is a lot of these services, our intention is to have the same um, experience in the outpost, but it's just going to be a little bit more difficult for us to think about things like some of these really large scale services and how we can get that to operate inside an outpost. But RDS awesome um announcement sorry to steal your thunder there, ah, that's all right that's all right i had that ready to go on one of my questions due to the recent release and talking with you i was like oh man i gotta ask matt about this one very cool no i, I mean i'm super excited and, and s3 as well that's been a huge um question mark uh that customers have been asking like hey EC2, EC2-based services like eks ecs rds even um they all use ec2 and Outpost is inherently an EC2-based platform. What about things like S3? Now, we are bringing S3 to the Outpost, and so we'll see other services as well. Um, so pretty cool stuff. Um, I do like that um, when we built the Outpost, it's really built on EC2 and VPC. So it's the same kind of constructs that you use in the region. You know, like the first thing I do in an AWS region uh, is like I want to deploy an application um, unless I'm doing something like serverless, which I, I don't know much about. So don't quiz me on that one. But um, I'll, I'll basically remove that from my list. Features. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll basically just go into the region and say, okay, I want to deploy something. I'm going to spin up a VPC now. Where's the VPC going to connect to? I need an IGW or I need a VGW or a transit gateway. Um, you know, what am I going to add on to that VPC architecture? Where where do I want to deploy my instances? What subnets? I'll be my, build my routing tables, who I want to communicate with. You do that same kind of thing in the outpost. You have a VPC, you build a subnet, you build a route table, you attach an LGW, the local gateway to the VPC, and you figure out, okay, where do I want my applications to communicate to? So it's the same thing, it's the same experience. Um, now there are some additional API calls that you would do with the LGW. Um, so we have uh, Elastic IPs assigned to an LGW and they're part of a customer owned IP range. So there's a few little differences and there always will be, but for the most part, it's the same experience that you'd expect in the region, which is awesome, I love that. You mentioned S3 in there. I know that one's kind of tricky uh, being in an outpost and you want the same reliability uh, and availability for S3 within that one. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I'm excited to hear how we've done that, how we're able to achieve that and what's coming up with that one. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what you can or can't share on that one, so I won't put you on too much on the spot with it. Yeah, I think um, what I will say is S3, um, and here's a quiz question for you. What was the first service that AWS ever launched? SQS. That's always a always a good one. <laughs> so listen, people, I got to jump in there. I posted that on Twitter 
uh, two weeks ago and had it on my uh, uh, CJ2 pub talk with Jeff Barr. Uh, so that was a pop quiz I did on that one. But it is still debatable, though, I heard. It is between what between S3 and, and SQS. Yeah, well, they, they were. Okay. I had two different sides there. Jeff Barr wrote a post uh, back. Oh my God! And in that one, I quoted him that it said SQS, but then there was still some like you know I don't know back and forth. What what you? I didn't mean to jump in there, but what's your answer? No, we should we should probably get to the bottom of that one. I mean, it's a it's um, super interesting where people think it's EC2 or maybe even VPC. But I think the the point I always uh, try to portray with, you know, what was the first service launch at AWS? SQS followed by S3 followed by EC2 Classic. So VPC was something that came along a lot later. And I think VPC came about in maybe it was 2011, um, somewhere around there. And so basically, you've got this service S3 that was designed to be publicly accessible. And so S3 natively, you would talk to a public IP to reach an S3 bucket. It's a service that sits in the public AWS realm. Now with a VPC, it's actually the private AWS realm. So it's a private realm you control with your CEDAR addressing and your security groups and knuckles and routing and all that kind of good stuff. And so when you want to bridge those two domains, you used to have to use an IGW. So you take a VPC, you attach an IGW, and then you can connect through to S3 in the public realm using an Elastic IP. A lot of the feedback we heard from customers was, actually, I've got this private construct, the VPC, I want to keep it private. And so then we deployed um, EC2 endpoints or VPC endpoints. And S3 and DynamoDB use what's called a gateway endpoint and private link endpoints or interface endpoints, of which there's about, I think, 50-odd services that support this mechanism now. You can drop all of these services into a VPC privately. So the big question mark is, when we have an outpost and we start thinking about S3, what model are we going to use? And I would say um, we are looking at if you've got an outpost, it's S3 that's essentially publicly accessible from your LGW or from your, your local networking. And we're still working out what the, the details actually look like. What I'd like to see as well is I've got my VPC, it's in the outpost, and then I have a VPC endpoint to S3 privately. So I don't need to go via the LGW. So um, Right now, I don't have the answer because I, I don't know how we're going to build it. Um, but a um, few different mechanisms there on how we could offer S3 on an outpost. But um, TBD, we'll see when we get closer towards the end of the year. Uh, we will have to come back to this video and quote it out. Have the, you know, hey, listen, we said it's coming. <laughs> Here's what we've got. Uh, what did we do? How did we do this? And we'll come back. We'll have to do another uh, recording here and uh, another interview and, and come back to it. Well, let Okay, so let's do this. Let's let's see if I'm right. Uh, in a couple of months' time, I think we get, we will deploy S3 on an outpost, and uh, in a couple of months' time, I hope we'll have uh, private access to S3 via the VPC, um, and I hope you can also reach S3 via local native um, networking me uh, local native networking mechanism to to the outpost. Um, that's the way I think it's going to work. So yeah, we'll see in a couple of months time how it actually works. But um, we have announced that it's going to be there. So that's that much we know, which is awesome. Did you put in a request for this PFRQ? And uh, so it comes back at a tab and uh, <laughs> so you get an enhancement I, request? I, when we when we jump off uh, th this recording now, this, this session right now, when we jump off this session right now, I'm going to go and talk to the engineers that are looking at building this and making sure I am <laughs> right in three months time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey yeah it's in there john <laughs> all right so <laughs> hey this is how we need to build it because <laughs> I <wouldn't be> right. <laughs> uh, once again matt thank you so much thank you for your time i uh, really appreciate it everybody uh, i'll have this posted as, uh, as soon as possible and if you have any questions feel free to comment on the videos and i'll try to get them back to matt in a respectable time thanks matt sounds good thanks john